so much for that an enlightening um, uh, presentation. Um, very worrying stuff around digital cyber security and um, the war in Ukraine and what it is doing. And it's amazing what this war has taught us, quite a lot of things, you know, that we're dependent on Ukraine for wheat um, and, or, uh, and Russia's control of uh, energy, uh, gas uh, for, for Europe and all those kind of stuff. It, as it relates to um, stand, the standard group of our operations, it, would I be right in saying what you used to spend in building your branches has now been shifted in building your tech capabilities? Is, 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 is that what's happening? What's happening to your branches compared to what's happening to your digital platforms? Um, so the, there's the old idea that the branch is dead, long live the branch. All that is happening is that the nature of the branch is changing. There were times when you were much younger, uh, uh, in Harare, I guess, yeah. uh, where you had these massive mausoleums, right? Uh, they're no longer uh, appropriate. You still need a branch, but they're now much smaller. Uh, they use less space because people still want to go to a branch for the purposes of dealing with a human being to solve a problem, uh, to talk to somebody about their will or about a payment that's gone bad and so forth. So the large branch is dead but long live the branch. The smaller branch with um, more sales and more human interface and less perhaps processing and service. One of the reasons those branches used to be very big was you'd have a small space where you're interfacing with a client and then you'd have armies of people in the back reconciling you know, payments and so forth. Um, much of that has now been digitized which makes your branch, branch smaller. But the proposition in your, in your question is a very important one. Uh, there is very little between a bank or a financial institution and an IT company these days because we spend so much money on, on IT, um, vast amounts of money. Um, and the difference is just that we're regulated and they're not. <laughs> but essentially, we hold us of big capital and a lot of that capital is tied up in IT systems and processes that facilitate uh, the movement of money. Talk to me about this conversation that you are uh, interesting that you mentioned uh, Ralph and Peter because uh, uh, we heard him yesterday and they said, ask him how the branches are going. Um, who is paying for the lunch? Have you decided who's going to pay for the lunch? Is, is there going to be uh, consolidation? Is there going to be conversations about let's get into bed together? No, I think there's constant conversations with a whole series of people. So let me just give you a number of examples which, yeah. uh, which, which are important to consider. Uh, take Standard Chartered. <clears throat> um, for one thing, they're a cousin of ours. Uh, we yeah. share a name, we've got a long history. So we've got a relationship with them that goes back a long way. We compete with them ferociously in corporate and investment banking. But we partner with them on clearing because they're in parts of the African continent where we are not, and we're in parts of the African continent where they are not, and we clear the RAND for them, for, for example. I make that point that as the fintechs, the big techs, discover that they need partnering with banks because a banking license is very expensive. Um, those armies of risk managers I was telling you are very expensive. The cyber security, that I was referring to is very, very expensive. The, the, those security teams are very, very expensive. And if you're going to enter deposit taking and making payments, you need to invest. Therefore, you need to partner. So on the one hand, we'll be competing with some of them uh, and financial services. I'm terrified of and financial services suddenly becoming a player on the continent. Um, but I'd love to be able to partner them. I'm terrified of... Uh, a Vodacom or an MTN becoming a fully fledged bank because they've got distribution capability, et cetera. But uh, I'd like to see them write the check that they need to write for, <laughs> for the risk management that they have to put in place. Yeah. My point is we will be competing with some people and we'll be partnering with others. Mm. It sounds like it's a conversation that will, I, I think, uh, with uh, more innovation in both spaces might, you know, might uh, end up with both of you agreeing to pay the lunch. Um, talk to me now, Sim, about your 
within the space, I love this, the, the way your colleague has described the main market, which is the bottom market. Looking at the main market across the continent, mm. what's your footprint like? And what are your strategy for geographical spread on the continent? Uh, okay, so um, one of the features of banking is that you can grow either by uh, uh, market penetration, so you increase your distribution channels, open branches, ATMs, etc. Product proliferation, you increase your products and services, either by yourself or in partnership with others. Um, thirdly, by geographic expansion, you go into new territories, uh, and or by way of acquisition, you you know, you buy businesses. And Standard Bank has historically grown by way of all of those methods, okay. with a result that we represented in 20 countries in roughly 75% of sub-Saharan GDP. However, the bulk of that is mainly in wholesale banking, because the infrastructure necessary to run a retail bank takes a long time to build and is incredibly expensive. And I keep saying, so the big techs, the fintechs, and the telcos, they know that they need to write those checks for the purposes of entry into, into the space. So it's mainly through wholesale banking. So if you look at the network of Standard Bank outside South Africa, it is largely wholesale, and we are still building our retail capability. In places like Nigeria, we're still continuing to sell more products, build the infrastructure, uh, look for partnerships. The same applies to our operations uh, in East Africa. And then, of course, we look for opportunities to buy, uh, where people are selling banks where they are leaving. Um, but because you have to be strict in your capital allocation, you can't overpay for these, for these businesses. We're looking to grow in the Wemu region, West, uh, West Africa. Uh, we have an operation in Cote d'Ivoire, um, and that environment looks quite interesting. Um, we're not represented in the Maghreb, so th the north, we're looking to grow there as well, uh, but it's a fiercely competitive environment. Right. The Moroccans, for example, are very competitive, as are the Egyptians, and they're all moving, the Moroccans down the west coast, the Egyptian down the east coast, and then the Nigerians also continue to grow. My point is that the competition between the incumbent banks is fierce, it's with the international players, as well as with the fintechs, the telcos, and the, and the, um, and the big techs. Uh, but growth then into that main market uh, is difficult. It's expensive, and you have to look for innovative ways to, to, to grow there. You, you mentioned the <coughs> Africa free trade area, yeah. uh, and you sounded positive. But I, I hear um, a lot of people saying not much is happening there. Talk to me about what you would want to see happening around the Africa free trade area to make banking uh, much more viable? What, what opportunities do you, do you see being presented by this free trade area? Well, first of all, if you reduce uh, barriers to trade, uh, you increase the movement of goods uh, and capital, it's in the interest of banks uh, for that to happen. The ease of moving people. So. My, it brings tears to my eyes to think of how difficult it is to get an IT person to move from, let's say, Mozambique to come and work in South Africa, or to move a South African, let's say, cyber security expert to go and work in, for argument's sake, Namibia. Because of sovereignty, we want our own people first, etc. And all the arguments are the same. The arguments you will hear by South Africans are on all fours with the arguments you'll hear by the Namibians. Um, uh, and, and so hopefully the, the free trade area agreement loosens that up, reduces those, trade, those barriers, makes it How easier. How hopeful for are you? How ho I'm very hopeful. So we're, very, we're participating in, 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 the, in the structures. Um, uh, we're hopeful that the agenda is going to start to address them, you know, deal with the visas, you know, reduce the... The, the, the barriers. The other one which is important, uh, and Ralph and I, I think agree on this one, and that is um, if the continent is going to compete in the fourth industrial revolution, then we've got to accept, for example, that uh, you know, things need to move to the cloud. 
I mean, it's preposterous that 52 countries would insist that all the data processing happens on premises in those countries, because that guarantees the exclusion of our beloved continent from participating globally. So you have to accept that some of your data is going to sit outside your own jurisdiction. But the authorities at the moment are still adamant that you know, some countries say you're going to process everything uh, in country. Well, then that just guarantees that that particular country will fall outside the movement of money, yeah. capital, goods, um, uh, that moves between other parts of the continent and other parts of the world. Hopefully, the a ACFTA addresses that too, yeah. that we get with the program, allow the movement of data between countries. Yes, respect the sovereignty and the laws in a particular country, but make it easy to move information. Let me go to, um, I, I did indicate that um, a part of what uh, we like to do on In Conversation is to, to learn from your experiences. And one of your experiences was moving from being an attorney into, into where you are right now. Talk yeah. to us about that process of deciding, I'm not going this way, I'm now going towards finance. What, what made you make that decision? I think a combination of an incredible dissatisfaction with uh, the practice of law and just luck. So I completed my articles. I knew I was not enjoying this. I then went to study, like, like I told you. Um, having returned, got admitted as an attorney, I'd walk into the office and I'd see those files and the timesheets that you'd have to fill in, and I just, I'm not going to do this. Um, and as that was happening, I got a call from a gentleman who had been a partner at the firm, who was now part of a small structured finance house, a boutique. They wanted a, a young slave to come and draw their contracts. I was game, joined them, and worked with uh, them starting off as the young associate was drafting their contracts, learned a little bit about credit, had to learn about how accounts work. I did an arts degree, so I had you know, double entry bookkeeping. What is that? So I had to teach myself that kind of thing. Um, the company was Real Africa Duralink. It started off as a small structured finance house and it grew dramatically and it became a listed financial institution and a bank. It had operations in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Um, I had the privilege of traveling to Zimbabwe with them from time to time. A fantastic business, listed on the stock exchange. That's relevant because that's where the luck that comes in. I was lucky to be able to see a business that started off as a structured finance business and it became a bank and learned what that means. Um, learned about credit, learned about how to apply for a banking license, <coughs> how to list the company. Uh, and then in 2000, I left them to join the Great Standard Bank. And, uh, and um, you, you've gone through a very interesting um, experience, uh, Sim, which a lot of people have not been through. You were appointed joint CEO with yep. other three people, two people, am I right? I was appointed uh, deputy with three, there were three of us. Yeah. And then I was appointed joint CEO with Ben Kruger. And then you were eventually appointed CEO, so CEO yeah. uh, September 20, 2017. Quite talk, right. to, talk, to, oh, talk to me about that experience, what it was like. Um, for me, it sounds like you are in a, in, a, in a long examination, in a long test, and you don't know how this thing is going to work out. Is, is that the best way of picking out the right person uh, as far as succession is concerned? What was your experience like? Um, to be completely frank and candid with you, it was excellent. And the reason I say that is because a large part of the culture of Standard Bank, and those of you that know Standard Bank, is that it's a very collaborative culture, uh, which has got its strengths, but also has got its darker side, but it's collaborative. Decisions get made in committee. Um, it operates very much like a professional partnership. If you think about PwC, Deloitte, et cetera, uh, you think about law firms, uh, people run their own practices, but they do so in partnership. Decisions get made jointly. The allocation of capital is done jointly. Uh, if you think about investment banks or merchant banks, they're also partnerships, and they're run like that. And a large proportion of Standard Bank um, 
is actually merchant banking and investment banking. In fact, while we're at it, our corporate and investment bank is without a doubt the largest in the country. It's multiples in size when compared to, to our competitors. And so a large part of that culture then is professional services, partnership, joint decision making, and so forth. So when we were asked to play the role as uh, joint deputies, it was an easy thing. It made perfect sense. It was not a strange uh, concept. Um, and when the joint CE proposition was made, it also made perfect sense. Deutsche Bank does, has done that for years. Goldman Sachs, I mean, if you Google them, for years, um, they, they've done that. Uh, as we speak, the likes of uh, Netflix, Oracle, uh, Harris Polis, Cipla, Sassol, also examples of where that has been done. And it usually happens where either for succession planning purposes where you make the deputies joint or when you make the top people joint where you are facing a situation either of crisis or where you are consolidating a far-flung organization. Think of SAP. Yeah. SAP had the same situation where they had large operations in the United States and large operations in Europe and they split the responsibilities. In our case, we had a large international business which needed to be wound down. And people had to be on airplanes talking to regulators, staff, clients, as that business was being wound down from roughly 2010, if you remember. That process has actually all but been done. All we're left with now is the 40% shareholding we've got in ICBC S in the United Kingdom. Okay. And once that's done, that process will be complete. So one person was running with that, the other one was running with South Africa and the African see, operations. Let's use other historical examples while we're at it yeah. of this notion of, uh, of joint leadership. So uh, you speak of the triumvirate, Marcus Crassus, Julius Caesar, Pompey. It was necessary at the time, although not for the same historical reason, but it was necessary at the time that you have that triumvirate uh, uh, running things. Think of uh, Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great was in a joint Tsar arrangement. Um, and so there are many examples of it. They make sense at a particular time, but generally you end up with a, a single CEO uh, process. Um, speaking for myself, uh, the process with Ben Kruger when we did it was fantastic. Um, it worked, we made decisions jointly, um, and it was also very good for my health um, because Travel is a burden, mm. um, and to be able to have somebody else dealing with things outside the continent while I was spending time in Lagos, Harare, etc., while somebody else was was good for my health and my family. Mm. Would I do it again? Without doubt. Would I do it again, even with a criticism? I welcome the criticism, but I would do it again under similar circumstances. Are you still on talking terms with Ben Kruger? <coughs> Absolutely. <laughs> in fact, Ben is now retired. Yeah. And his offices are just down the road from us. I had coffee with him on Monday. Oh, fantastic. So it, it worked. It worked. Yeah. It worked. Um, how do you lead yourself? What are the core leadership principles? With a great deal of disorder. <laughs> <laughs> um, and chaos. So um, where do we start? So. As you know, I went to a Catholic school, so maybe yeah. let me start there. I went to Sacred Heart College, and the Sacred Heart College is run by the Marist Brothers. It's an order of brothers, and the headmaster at that school at the time was one Dr. Neil McGurk, who's still alive. What a man. Mm. And one of the things I learned from him was an abiding love for the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, things like the Summa Contra Gentiles, Summa Theologica, etc. And an important dimension of that is the notion of natural laws. So how do I lead myself? One of my biggest beliefs coming from that tradition is that uh, things will happen on the basis of the reason and the best reason supportive of that process in, in layman terms. And even in business that applies. So even when you are going through the most difficult circumstances and situations, always remember that things will follow the natural progression and the natural laws. So that's the one sort of idea. The second one is the inscription at the Oracle of Delphi. 
Um, know thyself. And in fact, know thyself in order to be thyself, as well as nothing in excess. An important principle. Spend time with yourself from time to time. Have a workshop uh, from time to time. And list what you stand for, <laughs> the things that you believe in, your values, and then have an action plan. Uh, the Jesuits um, have a number of principles that are similar to that. Uh, and interestingly, the Jesuits, while they are priests, don't believe in prayer. They believe in action. So have that list of things that you're going to do. Don't spend too much time praying. Pray if you must. But please go out there and do the things that, uh, that, that work here. The next one is, uh, is love. Love in the sense of uh, a profound reverence for the humanity in others. Um, and try and live that out. Um, live for a higher purpose. Aim for something greater than yourself. Uh, in the case of Standard Bank, by way, for example, I work there because I genuinely believe in its purpose, which is Africa is our home, we drive a growth. And everything that we do is centered around that purpose. Um, and you ask any average standard banker, they will know that that's our purpose. Africa is our home, we drive a growth. Uh, and maybe the last one, uh, another principle, is always remembering that you should not be attached too much to places and material things, but always think about innovating and moving forward. And the notion that Ignatius Loyola used to demonstrate that, or the concept was living with one foot raised. Mm. So you just have that image, mm. one foot raised, you're ready to move. So if you need to uh, heed the call from uh, Mube to come, you just come and have the conversation <laughs> with one foot raised, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Trevor says, come, you get in your car and you come. And we are, I'm so grateful <coughs> when I call him and I said, come, you didn't hesitate and we're grateful. I shall turn to you now, good people, for questions. Uh, we have, I think we have a way of getting live questions, do we? Any live questions, questions on, on the platform? But in the room, do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a microphone for, for her? Um, if you could just state your name, where you come from, who you represent. If you represent yourself, that's fine. And please ask your question. Thank you so much and good morning everyone and thank you Mr. Shabalala. I'm Fiona Butt. I'm from St. David's Mariston and across the road. So that's a fellow Marist School of Sacred Heart. <laughs> and what I'd like to ask is um, with our, our youngsters at St. David's and I think in the world now, youngsters want to know that they are having, um, they're involved in a purpose driven um, career and you've just spoken about purpose mm. now and what Standard Banks is. What would be your personal advice to a youngster who is wanting to go into banking? as to, with any bank, sorry, not just Standard Bank, <laughs> yeah. as to what, um, how can they have a purpose-driven um, banking career? What should they be focusing on? Well, I would, so first of all, Linanda was a, a fierce competitor. Yeah, we hated them. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> as only siblings yes, can hate one another, yes. right? So um, they used to beat, beat us. A good um, kind of hate. Good kind of hate, yeah. yeah. Between siblings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think I would say as they finish their matric and as they go to university, they should follow their passions. Um, don't go and study what you think is going to make you money. Go and study what you think you're going to be happy with would be the first one. The second one would be uh, you can use me as an example. You don't have to do a BCom. In fact, I'd discourage you from doing a BCom, and I genuinely would. Mm. I'd say study and go and learn and learn to think. So follow your passions, try and study stuff that will force you to think, and hold your choices lightly. So if you start off saying, mm, I want to do economics and history and English, go for it. And if you change along the line, it's OK. Fourthly, don't commit to career outcomes too early. Um, as you grow and as you, as you are. Fifthly, the world has actually moved away, in my view, from that notion of, well, which we had in South Africa, that business leaders in South Africa were either chartered accountants or failed lawyers. 
Um, <laughs> we now accept that they can be engineers, they can be psychology majors, um, they can be biologists, they can be medical doctors. Because what you need in leadership is not people who've drummed, you know, you know, double entry bookkeeping into you, but you, the ability to think and to lead. Um, and then you will learn um, how to read income statements and balance sheet as you go along. And I think that that's very, very important. Businesses are human endeavors, so it's actually very important to, to know and understand the humanities and learn and know how to think. Um, I would also then say to them, once you've completed following your passions, um, be open to the choices available to you because in a bank, you can, let's say you're a psychology major, there's a place for you. You can go into marketing, human capital, uh, et cetera. If you've done a PhD in physics, uh, we want those quants, uh, those people that crunch our numbers, figure out you know, how to use data, et cetera. Uh, you got a master's in economics, there's a place for you. Our economics division is huge. It's like, a, it's like an advisory firm. And I hope there are no competitors here, but it's the best in town, the one at Standard Bank. <laughs> the competitors are online. <laughs> They're online. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, don't rush into things, follow your passions, hold your choices lightly. And then if you really want to work for a bank, make sure it's one that matches your own values and one which you think you will be home at because there's nothing like going to work and hating it. Yeah. So figure out, is this a place where I'll be happy? Uh, is the culture the type of culture I would enjoy? Um, That's a very important question and I, I like the way you've answered it. One thing that you've said which resonates with me quite greatly is spending your time with yourself. Um, but I, when I talk to young people and say, you need to spend time with yourself, the response is, but I, I'm busy, I don't have time. But how are you going to be busy if you don't know who you are? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Say your name, who you are, who you represent. Thank you. My name is Laura Clement. And likewise, I'm from St. David's Marist in and I'm head of advancement at the school. Um, Mr. Shabalali, you said that we, we might come back to the issue of social, the, the, the social aspect um, and social justice and so on. I'm wondering whether, and, and I know on a personal level you may, but at a, at a corporate level in the sector, the, the, those terms that you're talking about with other sectors where there, are, where there is investment, where there's partnerships, where there's conversations, conversations about the fourth industrial revolution and so on, are those conversations happening with education in the pipeline of, that leads into all of those sectors, skills, the conversations around skills, retention, and so on? Obviously, for us, education is where it begins, and not just from a skills and a knowledge perspective, but where we, there, is a, there is a value base, leadership, aspects of philanthropy, and all of those. And I'm wondering what your interaction is with education, if we were going to talk about the social impact of that banks and other and other corporates um, and the, the role and the responsibility they have. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sam? So, yeah, so I was referring to uh, the six strategic value drivers uh, at Standard Bank. So the, the, the value that we create is driven around, uh, firstly, uh, our focus on clients and what we do for them. Secondly, it is our staff and how they feel about what we do with and for them because that's an important dimension of how well we serve our clients. The third one is we are a risk-driven organization. Uh, banks are very dangerous uh, organizations. They're highly leveraged and they can cause economic collapse. So they're heavily regulated and therefore risk is an important element uh, and dimension of that and conduct, how we behave ourselves how we sell our products uh, and, and so forth. Next would be uh, operational excellence. We're trying to do things as efficiently as possible. Fifth is financial outcomes. We are a financial institution after all. People invest capital in us <clears throat> and they expect us to generate returns that adequately um, reward them for the risks that they take in us. But the sixth one is social, economic, and environmental impact. 
which we measure. And we formulate our commitments under social, economic, and environmental impacts on the basis of a number of principles, which include the SDGs. Uh, it includes our commitment to having signed the principles for responsible banking by the United Nations. And then to bring it closer to home, there are certain core areas where we are focused on in our business, but also in our uh, uh, CSI work, which revolve around health, and they also revolve around education. That's important to us because we require a solid, soft infrastructure for us to be successful as a business. And there are various initiatives that we're involved with, which include um, our Tutua Trust, which is a trust that is where we set money aside effectively to invest in education. Um, and we invest in certain schools, and there's a process that, uh, where that happens. So education is an important element of, uh, of our commitment. We work very closely with the universities. Um, and because of the limitation of our resources, we have to be focused. So we're very intent on working with the universities on developing a pipeline that helps us prepare for this brave new world, yeah. the, the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and so we've got programs with them uh, that help our people to become, on the one extreme, um, engineers. We've got programs working with people on developing SMEs that are involved in IT, because it's an important element of, uh, of, of our commitment. Um, and we also work with uh, universities throughout the continent to facilitate the development of the knowledge, the skill, and the talent necessary for, for our competitiveness. I have to say, whilst we have got these social, economic, and environmental commitments, they have to be tightly coupled to our purpose as an organization. You know, we can't be all things to society uh, because our resources are, are limited. If you're confused about healthcare, it's easier to put your trust in us, where every contribution is secure and you can be sure that your membership card will be accepted. So relax, you're in safe hands with us, with access to world-class medical providers, little to no shortfalls, and free iGo membership for all our Seamus members. Join us today. Together, we make a difference. A question at the top there and another <coughs> one over there. So there's a quite a number of hands. I think this will be last. We need to be done by quarter to at least. Um, yes, sir? Let's try and make our questions uh, uh, short. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah. Um, thanks as well, Sam. I think the session has really been insightful. So my question... By the way, I'm, I'm, it's Debo Hall. I'm representing Apropos Business Solutions, you one of the partners. <laughs> so I've just taken a note for myself, and um, it's with regards to cyber security. And I think it's a bit of a tough one, but maybe you'll be able to navigate. Um, with, you've mentioned and you've alluded with so much crime happening um, in South Africa and the banks being part of the main target for this. So I've experienced, and I think with many other South Africans, where small amounts of money get taken. And it's, a, it's an eight rand there, it's a 15 rand there. And then obviously over time, these amounts become substantial. So how is Standard Bank or, or the banks in general, in your opinion, feel that they are trying to mitigate this risk? Because if it's happening to one person, surely it's happening to millions of other people. And these people at the end of the day are gaining a lot of money where they've taken maybe 100 rand from me, but then 500 to another customer. How is the banks trying to make sure that this aspect of the customer's account is not taken advantage of? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you for that question. Sim? Um, very good question, and it's a very, very difficult one. There's an industry initiative um, where the banks working with the, uh, 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 the Bank Association of South Africa to find ways and means to make sure that the gaps that exist in the network allowing people to steal small sums of money are blocked. So there's actually an industry initiative uh, to, 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 to do that. 
Secondly, we provide our clients with a lot of education to make sure that they protect themselves, um, ranging from, you know, under what circumstances <laughs> you should click on buttons when you get an email, how to avoid phishing, um, how to protect your own personal data. And then thirdly, we spend a lot of money internally, as you would know, uh, with teams of people that try and identify strange movements in people's behavior so that action can be taken. Um, and I made mention of the quants that I was uh, talking about who we hire, who help us to identify uh, through data analysis strange patterns in behavior and accounts and then we act on them. Uh, we've got a large fraud department um, which helps us to do this. Sometimes that fraud department causes friction and annoys people, but generally we're able to block uh, inappropriate activity. And so ranging from industry initiatives that uh, try and prevent the theft of small amounts of money from people's accounts, right across to helping people identify what happens and how a phishing attack looks, right across to protecting our own systems inside the bank against cyber criminals, and then uh, in partnership with you as a client, helping you identify when a fraud happens and making sure that you're not uh, opening yourself up to, to, to fraud. Thank you, Sim. Very, very complex, um, but very painful point. Mm. Um, glad to hear that uh, it's being dealt with. Yes, sir, and then ma'am, and then ma'am, and that's it, hey? Um, yes, sir. Morning. A, a very brief question, so that we give others time to ask questions. Yes, sir. Morning. Um, thank you very much, Sim, Trevor, uh, for putting this together. Um, my name is Mandla Makubela. Um, I am a recent graduate of this institution. Um, and then currently I'm an analyst at Nielsen IQ. Um, really my question is on what's happening in the world, right? So we've moved and we've seen globalization and you know, interconnected supply chains and really what that, that has meant for the world. But over the past two years, I think that has shot us, we've shot ourselves in the foot um, through COVID and now we are seeing with um, the thing that's happening in Europe. Um, so we really need to look inwards to how do we start developing domestic capabilities? And what I want to know is from a Standard Bank point of view, um, which key sectors are you guys looking at to invest in? So when we come out of our learning and building experience and we're looking at key industries and sectors to um, go and build businesses in, where should we be looking? And if you can maybe give me that answer um, on a long-term period, um, maybe next five, 10 years, if you can't see that far. I believe you can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a soothsayer, I'm just a humble banker. <laughs> um, I so, really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. So just a couple of points to make. You make a, so globalization in my view is a long-term process. It doesn't come to an end. Right from the Paleolithic age to the Middle Ages, to the Enlightenment era to today is a progression, in my view, of the world becoming increasingly interconnected. So even with the setbacks, I would say to you the long-term trend of the world is to be interconnected, and therein lies some of the opportunities. If you take a long view, you will position yourself to take advantage of that increased interconnectedness of the world. The second point I would make to you is, uh, you know, we've just been through a pandemic, right? It's a one in a hundred year pandemic. But what we know from pandemics, is that the economy reverts to mean. So after the Black Plague in Europe, after you know, the plague of Justinian, after the Spanish flu in the uh, early 1900s, the situation reverts to mean. After world wars, after major catastrophes, the world goes back to mean. So if you're a business person, you should be identifying when that will happen and how you ought to position yourself. The next point I would make to you is, um, the South Africa has to take advantage of its endowments and position itself to enter the global supply chains that you are alluding to. So take Mauritius. Mauritius has identified that the Asian supply chains have been disrupted and it's like inserted itself in there. And so has Kenya. So what should we be doing? Let's accelerate build, rebuilding our ports and make sure that we can move our goods as quickly as possible on our roads to our ports or through rail. 
So if you're a business person, you should be saying, well, mm, there might be opportunities in logistics, so how do I position the business? There'll be opportunities in um, electricity as uh, the electricity uh, strategy of the country gets executed. Oh, MTN, they've just done the spectrum auction. So people will be needing licenses. Oh, they'll be doing 4G and 5G. So who is going to need what equipment? Who's going to need to move that equipment? So how do we position our business? South Africa is a water crisis. So what opportunities arise in the context of a water crisis? South Africa is now part of the AF ACFTA. Um, and there's going to be maybe an opening up of the visa system. So maybe tourism is going to accelerate. You're in tourism, so how do you position yourself in that context? At a high level, I think I would summarize it. Very, very like good. That, very know. good insights mm -hmm. there. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, short question. Thank you so much for, <coughs> for being patient. <clears throat> Still morning. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you, Trevor and Sil, for your time. My name is um, Sarah Mukwebo, and I'm a student here at Gibbs. So um, I, I want to find out um, what what facilities and say support systems that Standard Bank have for informal businesses. And my question stems from the remark you made, where you were saying you were wondering why is it that. Um, there's so much difference between Kampala and, say, Alex, for instance. And largely the reason for that is South Africa does not allow for informality. It, South Africa is a country, whether it's government or the private sector, pretends as though the informal sector does not exist and facilities for those people or support systems are actually not developed for them. If, for instance, I were to sell whatever I think would be attractive on the R21 on the way to Oar Tambo, I'll be arrested by the end of the day because our country does not allow for informality. Our municipalities do not allow for people to be economically active where there's a lot of food traffic. So that's why there is actually that much difference. And it's, it, it's such a crippling thing because that's why we had the, the crisis that we had with COVID relief as a country, that we were unable to, to actually have a reach to the people that needed the support, um, the, support the most because we, we wanted to use formality as a qualifying criteria forgetting that, for instance, the whole of Brie has mm. uh, informal businesses, but they actually keep <laughs> the country going and households actually fed and lit and all those kinds of things. That's why even the taxi industry is not, the potential that that industry has is not being tapped into because we have this obsession with wanting to formalize them, mm. whereas they're an already um, organized industry. I think it's one of the most um, organized informal industries, but we refuse to tap into that because we have this obsession with registration, with formality, and all those kinds of things. So that's why I want to find out if Standard Bank has any facilities or support systems for informal businesses. And when we speak of SMMEs, we don't necessarily speak for those that are actually going to the CIPC to do their registration and have a tax certificate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And only then they can then get um, assistance from either government or the private mm. sector. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Very important point. Again, we could spend a half a day on that, isn't it? We could spend half a day in it because it's a very, very complicated very topic. Question. But maybe to make a few points, um, the, the, the first one is one of the things just one just has to accept is a bank, as I said, is a derived industry and it's regulated. So that is sort of the binding constraint and forces us to play in our lane. There are certain things we can't do, even though we would love to. Um, secondly, in order to lend, for example, to somebody, it does require formality. So if I'm gonna lend to uh, an entity, I need to do KYC, and therefore I need documents, and therefore I need to know that they're paying tax, uh, et cetera. And that's the binding constraint. Um, and therefore the question becomes, well, how do we work with authorities to make it possible to help traders who require, for legislative purposes, formality so that we can lend to them and break that cycle of, uh, of, uh, of informality. I think the next point to consider is we are trying to innovate uh, in the space. We've got an, what we call a trader ecosystem. We're trying to figure out how to use our capabilities as a formal bank in partnership with people that are on the ground working with FMCGs to provide products and services to, 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 to those businesses. Uh, and that 
implies then a need for us to be able to partner with others that know uh, 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 that client base. But it is a very difficult and a fraught one. The, the proposition that says that we've got a large informal economy, I think, is correct. The question is, how do you then normalize that, uh, um, uh, that economy? Um, is it appropriate to even think of uh, normalizing it? I think it is. Uh, by getting rid of the red tape that exists so that it's easier for those businesses to, to, to operate. You know, her point um, is, is so valid because yep. the example you give about Uganda, <laughs> yeah. I've driven on that road from Kampala Airport to, uh, to the city. I mean, the activity from 3 a.m. is unbelievable. But the mm -hmm. question is, are those people paying taxes? <laughs> exactly. Um, mm -hmm. I know, are they, you know, oh, blah, 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 blah. So it, it's a very interesting point. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, thank you for your... Uh, responding. Ma'am, you're going to be the last one. <laughs> Very quick. Hi there, guys. Uh, my name is Jessica Gardner. I'm from Worth Marketing Solutions and Jessica Gardner Photography. And um, I've got a question with regards to um, technology. Um, you mentioned that shifting away from building branches to building apps and technology. And I'd like to know, as much as I love technology as well, apps and AI, and growing a bit more in that s sector as well, I want to find out what impact will that have on our economy and the job sector? How do people feel about getting replaced by apps, getting replaced by robots? <laughs> Can that um, make, a, a f already the unemployment is 35%, the highest we've ever had in history. And will that contribute towards that? Will it help create jobs in another sector? Do you feel it helps employees or do you feel like it takes jobs away? Will there be riots? What's, what's the future? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Sim? <laughs> Very difficult question. I, I think, I think um, we have seen a number of revolutions, a number of industrial revolutions. So the industrial revolution in Britain uh, in the 1800s, 1850s, uh, displaced the horse and cart, um, but replaced it with vehicles which created jobs but caused environmental degradation. Um, all revolutions have the effect of changing the way uh, people uh, operate, but they create opportunities. I would argue that even the fourth industrial revolution will do the same. There are certain jobs and certain activities that are always going to exist. Um, some are going to require people to work with machines. Others are going to be outright uh, human uh, activities. Think of nursing. Um, if you're going to be nursing uh, the elderly, I can't see how a robot is going to be doing that in the next 100 years. So you still require a human being. You still require empathy, et cetera. When people want to shout at us pursuant to our image, uh, our outage, sorry, that happened last Saturday, they didn't want to talk to uh, a, machine. a machine. They wanted to shout at SIM. You see what I mean? So complaints resolution uh, and that kind of uh, activity will remain human. It will require new skills. And I think the challenge for the universities and schools, uh, the Gibbs of the world, is how do we prepare people for that type of new environment. Uh, what new skills are going to be required? I'm positing that there will still be jobs, they'll be different, and the schools and the universities and business need to figure out which ones are going to be the most valuable. In our industry, I still believe that the best skills necessary are those that require people to work with bots and machines and also provide what's needed by human beings, empathy, listening, problem solving, etc. But Sima, I'll ask you one last question. Mm. What books have you read? Um, the people that watch us all over the world love book recommendations. I know you read quite a lot. What three books have you read that have uh, had a huge impact on you? Um, the first one is War and Peace uh, by Tolstoy. That's actually relevant in my view because one of the central themes about that is there are some things you just cannot do anything about. There's a guy called General Kutusov in that, uh, in, and Kutusov is 
portrayed as a bumbling idiot, a little bit like the CEO of a bank. Um, <laughs> and lots of noise happening around him, and he just accepts natural law and continues to, to operate. The second one is a book by Chris Lowney. Uh, it's about the Jesuits. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, what, what, a 350-year-old corporation that changed the world. It's about how the Jesuits... And it compares the Jesuits to J.P. Morgan, wow. for example. That must be interesting. Yeah. yeah. The third the one? Book. Um, the third book is by, uh, let's see, which one would I refer you to? The third one would be by Chris Moiker, and he writes about the Enlightenment. I can't remember the, the, the exact title, but it's about the Enlightenment, uh, the period just before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in answer partly to the question that was asked earlier. Fantastic. Sim, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be on In Conversation with Trevor, the South African series. Thank you so much for the insights that you shared. We are proud of what uh, the Standard Bank Group is doing, uh, and we're looking forward to you taking advantage of uh, the Africa free trade area uh, to get the co continent working together, increase in uh, trade between uh, African countries and the growth of uh, um, the, 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 the main market, which is the bottom market. So thank you. Thanks thank to you um, in the audience. This would not have been possible without you. Thank you to people that are, have been watching us online. Sim, you've been a star. Thanks a lot, thank my you. brother. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.